Welcome to Salisbury University On The Air, a program highlighting the activities and the people of the campus. My name is Susan Purnell. As the owner of a local store, I know that business is booming in Salisbury, but just how well business is doing is best understood by those at SU's Business, Economic, and Community Outreach Network, also known as Beacon. Within the Franklin P. Purdue School of Business, Beacon is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. And here to tell us about the organization and its history is its founding director, Dr. Memo Derricker. Memo, thank you for being with us today. Pleasure to be here. Always good to see you. So tell me, you've been with Beacon since the beginning. And so. how did it come about? Well, uh, when the school was endowed by Frank Purdue, uh, one of the recommendations made by the consultant that was hired to get the school accredited was that we needed to have an outreach entity on campus. Mm -hmm. So I was hired especially to create one or two outreach entities. And that's how the genesis of Beacon came to be way back 30 years ago. And it wasn't Beacon always, right? No, it wasn't Beacon. It started as Mid-Atlantic Sales and Marketing Institute together with the European American Business Institute. Mm -hmm. Then years later, it became the Project Management Group then it became the Enterprise Development Group, and finally it is the <laughs> We settled on Beacon. Beacon, yes. And what was the original plan for Beacon? The original plan was for, for um, faculty and students to have a place to do applied learning, to learn by doing, mm -hmm. as well as uh, serving the community, the mm -hmm. community's need for information, knowledge, data, those kinds of things. And have you seen over these 30 years a change in the relationship between the the school or Beacon and the community? Yeah, the community has, has really embraced both the school and Beacon. They know now that if they need any kind of business, economic assistance, knowledge, know-how, data, research to come to Beacon. We don't have to tell them here's what's available. They already know. Mm -hmm. They tell each other it's there and they come and ask for specific assistance, which gives our students and our faculty a wonderful opportunity to get engaged with the community. It really does. Tell me about some of the more recent projects that you've undertaken. Well, we became a, a very um, well-known expert o o on doing what's called the 3E approach. This is when we go to organizations for, uh, for profit companies, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and we look at a program or a project and we ask for these three questions. Is it effective? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Is it efficient? Are they using their limited resources in the best way to do it? Mm -hmm. And finally, where's the evidence? Can we demonstrate it through a dashboard or some metrics that it is doing? So we become kind of an evaluator of projects and programs. Other than that, our, our most common thing we do is economic impact studies and feasibility mm -hmm. studies. How do or do you as Beacon collect and analyze the information for your economic studies? So we have two ways of doing it. One, we're looking at sources that are already publicly available or, or we can acquire at, at a low cost. These are the secondary sources. But we also routinely survey about 2,500 opinion leaders in our region on a quarterly basis. Really? Wow. And, and I know, you know, we're here at an Institute of, of Higher Learning. Students are everything. How do the students play a part in all of that? So easily 80 to 85 percent of the work done at Beacon is done by students. Oh. Primarily by our graduate ass assistants and our graduate students who work on projects. We also have some undergraduate students who come to us as interns and a few as, as project assistants. But it's primarily geared towards our graduate students to give them that applied learning experience. So I'd, as I said, most of the work is done it's by done them by the under faculty and staff supervision, but by them. Now, you're known for the economic studies that we've just talked about, but I know you do so much more than that. Tell us about some of the other initiatives going on. So when a company or an organization is launching a new social marketing program, mm -hmm. they come to us. When they want to know the economic value of what they're doing, they come to us. When a developer wants to determine what percentage of the development should be commercial, what percentage industrial, what percent residential, they come to us. We do scenario analysis for them. So mm -hmm. anything that our faculty can teach upstairs in the second and third floors, we can then commercialize, turn it into knowledge and information for decision makers, mm -hmm. allow them to make better informed decisions. And you get paid for this. Yes, Beacon is a self-sustaining organization. It is. In fact, in the state of Maryland nomenclature, we are referred to as not a state of Maryland cost center, which means we're not funded by state appropriations. We're funded by client sponsorships. That's wonderful. And it is. You're successful in that. It is. Um, 
Tell me about other initiatives like, for example, shore trends. I know you look at what's happening on the whole eastern shore. Correct. Our, our three major initiatives are shore trends, mm -hmm. which looks at demographic, business, and economic trends in the nine counties of the eastern shore. Mm -hmm. This is where we use the 2,500 uh, opinion surveys. Right. And then we do um, sh um, aging on the shore is, is through our... Uh, shore Wisdom Initiative, uh, mm -hmm. Gray Shore Initiative. Sometimes it has two two words, but the center initiative is called Gray Shore, and underneath it we have something called Shore Wisdom. And then finally we do something called Bienvenidos a Del Marva. With, with uh, Gray Shore, we are not looking at the aging population. We're looking at organizations that work with that aging population. So it's more of a capacity enhancement. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with Bienvenidos a Del Marva, we're looking at organizations that work with the residents who were not born here. Did you know that in our region there are 31 different foreign languages in our school systems? I would not have known that, no. I, never, I don't know how that works. I mean, how they all communicate with one another. Well, by law, the schools have, have to, to learn English. accommodate, um, teach those uh, students English. Yes. And through them, their families benefit as well. That, that would be true. Let's get back to this gray shore. Um, I, so you're, you just explained to me that you're not really looking at the demographics at the, at the older people, but the issues affecting them. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, the, the organizations that work with our aging population mm -hmm. look at several different types of issues. They look at elder shelter. Where would these people live? How would they leave, mm -hmm. live? Nursing homes, uh, aging at home, which is the, the better option. You need to change the design of the home, make the doors wider, floors harder so that mm -hmm. wheelchairs can work, ramps, these kinds of issues. We also look at elder care. Obviously, as we get older, we have different and, and more health care needs. So collectively, we look at the capacity of our region to deal with these increasing and more sophisticated health care needs of our aging population. We look at issues at economic value or workforce value of uh, retirees. We have a lot of retirees coming here from outside the region. Mm -hmm. They golf, they fish, they have fun, but at, at sooner or later they get involved in businesses. They, they start mm -hmm. businesses, they volunteer at nonprofit organizations. So we look at that piece. And finally, unfortunately, we look at issues of crime and fraud because many a time our age, aging population tends to be a victim for people who want to take their money. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so those issues are not the only initiatives that you do. Tell us about some others and how you decide what kind of project to take on. So Bienvenidos a Del Marva, as mm -hmm. well as Grayshore, we do an annual meeting mm -hmm. where we bring in stakeholders, in, in, in involved people, people who are impacted by these demographic changes to a day-long meeting. And in mm -hmm. that meeting, we communicate with them, we hear from them, we talk to them, we bring experts from outside the region. And at the end of that day, my team takes over all that information with additional information they research. Mm -hmm. They put together an annual report, an annual set of recommendations. Mm -hmm. These recommendations, we internally refer to them as our manifesto, we share with elected officials at the local as well as regional and state level, saying that the, the community needs these things. As a result of those, certain projects get undertaken. For example, the Alzheimer's um, work that Mac Incorporated is doing mm -hmm. uh, for our aging population. For example, the opioid um, disease problems we're seeing in Wicomico, Somerset counties, mm -hmm. that now with external funding are being addressed. These come from those meetings, from those research programs, and then we evaluate some of these programs using our 3E methodology. Mm -hmm. So I understand more now about how you communicate with, you're, you're discovering what the issues are and then communicating back to Correct. government entities. Correct. And we, we are essentially a convener of mm -hmm. meetings, mm -hmm. discoverer of information, and generator of solutions, and an evaluator of the programs that deploy those solutions. Mm -hmm. So Memo, what are the things that you're most proud of? The thing I'm most proud of is when somebody who employs one of the Beaconites, by the way, uh, students who work at Beacon call themselves Beaconites. When Beaconites? Beaconites. So one of the things, the most thing, uh, uh, important thing for me is when an employer calls me, said we're promoting her, we are sending him to Washington, we need another Beaconite. That to me is my scorecard. Yes. That to me is my grading. They like what Beacon has done for this mm -hmm. person, that they want another one. And the students mm -hmm. who graduate from Beacon's activities tend to get jobs faster 
and they go up the career ladder faster than their peers because they have done it. They, they, sure. they saw they it. experienced it hands exactly. on. Um, and what do you hope Beacon will accomplish in the next 30 years? Uh, more students involved because mm -hmm. um, one of the things that also I'm very proud of is well over 70% of our revenues go back to students in the form of tuition remission oh. and in the form of stipends. So that enables them to do their studies. Some of our students wouldn't be able to do their MBAs were it not for Beacon providing that full tuition remission and that stipend that they, they live on. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to increase our services in the region so that we can add on maybe double the number of students who can go to our MBA program. That's a great goal. Uh, well, thank you so much. I, I learned pleasure. a lot today, and I really appreciate your spending some time here. Thank you, Susan, for having uh, me here. Absolutely. Next, we'll be joined by Christy Weir, Dean of the Franklin P. Purdue School of Business. But first, let's take a look at some of that real-world experience that students get within the Purdue School managing the Seagull Fund. The Seagull Fund uh, was created a number of years ago. Uh, it was actually a partnership between uh, a pair of donors, the Purdue School of Business, and the Salisbury University Foundation. And it gave real life experience for students in the Purdue School in managing real money, a real portfolio. There is a um, set amount, so it's about um, 1.4 million that varies. And we take a top down approach um, for our investment strategy. So we start off by saying, what is the economy going to do? and then we look into how do we do our sector allocations, and then from there, different teams um, get, get their own individual sectors and pick stocks. This investment portfolio class is really what's given them a leg up in getting jobs when they're not talking about pretend money, they're talking about real money that the university needs, um, and they're managing it. So the Seagull Fund definitely helped me um, figure out what I want to do in finance. I really think that is a very interesting field to go into just because it is a lot of hard work. There is a lot of um, research that you do for it. And at the end of the day, I think it's for a good cause. We have actually beaten the S&P this semester on like a one year, three year and a since inception basis. So we've been doing pretty well. It is one of the very first such funds established for undergraduate students. In fact, the first undergraduate student managed investment fund in the state of Maryland. It's really cool that SU has this experience for students because it's hands-on work on real stuff that happens in the real world. $1.4 million. What an amazing experience for those students available right here at SU. Next, we're joined by Dr. Christy Weir, Dean of the Purdue School of Business. Welcome, Christy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Great to see you again. So I know you've been at SU since 2009, and you've been the Dean of the Purdue School since 2015. 2015. Is that right? Yes. How did you find your way to the shore? Actually, I'm from the shore. You I was, are? I was born and raised in Caroline County. Oh, so okay. Mid-shore. Mid so I was so away. you're at home. I'm at home. I was away for a number of years, and when I had the opportunity to come back, I certainly jumped on it. And what did you do when you first came back? So I came back in 2009 as an assistant professor of management. Mm -hmm. My specialty is organizational behavior. I became associate dean in 2011 and dean in 15. So that's what you see. You're the organizational guy that keeps memos straight. Is that right? <laughs> we try. We try. <laughs> right. And how much of an impact do you see Beacon as having on the community? Certainly. So really the impact is far reaching. You know, it's really immeasurable from the specific projects that, that Memo and his team do to the goodwill that they provide, the building of relationships um, combined. It's really immeasurable and both within and outside of, of mm -hmm. the university. It's just incredible. Yeah, he, he gets, gets a lot of good PR for the college, doesn't Absolutely. he? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the Purdue School is known for having students come out and hit the ground running. Yes. Um, how does Beacon help with regard to that ethic? Certainly. So one of the hallmarks of the Purdue School is experiential learning. Mm -hmm. All of our students are involved in, in some way in an internship. And Beacon is one example of that. And I think it's a profound example in that students engage it, when they're working in Beacon, they engage on real world problems. They do impact studies. Mm -hmm. They do um, any, any type of study you can imagine that, that Beacon would work on. They're involved intimately. They're doing the work. They're understanding where the data is coming from. They're analyzing data. They're providing so real 
real-world solutions to, mm -hmm. to problems. And so, and that's why people keep asking for more Beaconites. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> absolutely, yes. That, that's so interesting. Um, having had Memo steering the ship for the last 30 years, I know it's given the uh, group quite a sense of continuity. Yeah. I mean, how can you explain the impact that having Memo there for all that time had? Has had. So Beacon's vision is really Memo's vision from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. um, what he has brought to Beacon, what he has developed through Beacon, his mentorship of all of our students, um, the continuity that he has brought, it, it's incredible. Um, I, I just, I can't imagine the institutional knowledge that Memo has and he brings to the role and so it, it's, it's invaluable. He for needs sure. to write a book. He does need to write a book. He could probably write a couple of books. I think he could. <laughs> um, and what would you say is, looking back on the history of Beacon, is the most impactful thing that they have contributed? So certainly many, many reports, many forecasting reports, uh, those certainly are important, but I think what is the most important thing is the impact on our students. Um, the experience that, that Beacon allows students to, to have, the mm -hmm. opportunities that, that are presented to students. Um, they, our students are our future leaders and they're getting the experience in Beacon that they will use as they embark on their careers. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember this uh, college started as a state teacher's college, yes. and that was the concept. Yes. Give them a classroom, and yes. there was an associate yes. um, classroom yes. right here on campus. Yes. Um, I, I went there, and we had student teachers all the time, and it was that same idea. Let them do it. It is the incubator to allow students to experiment mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. to grow, absolutely. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and telling us a little bit more about the importance of Beacon and, and our appreciation for Memo and all that he's done. Great. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Salisbury University finds so many ways to interact with the community and businesses in the area and region. Beacon exemplifies how beneficial their partnerships can be for all involved. Now that the spring semester is in full swing, there are many great events on campus. Here's a look at what is happening this month.
I'd like to thank my guests, Dr. Memo Dierker, Director of Beacon, and Dr. Christy Weir, Dean of the Purdue School of Business. I'm Susan Purnell, and this has been Salisbury University On The Air. Thank you for watching. And now here's another look at the activities on the campus this month.
Thank you for watching.